Okay, so this is the last lecture of this class. It's about intrinsic motivations, and we'll end talking a little bit about heuristics. So, um, you know, why do people climb mountains? You know, because they're intrinsically motivated to do so. We hear those terms quite a lot in psychology, and one of the things that is a constant push in the field of motivation is to get people to shift from extrinsically motivated, motivated by money or motiv motivated by grade, to intrinsically motivated. So some behaviors are done, well, maybe for no apparent external reason, not to get something. Extrinsic motivation comes from external sources like money and grades, but intrinsic motivation comes more internally, is not driven by necessarily an overt outcome. I do this behavior, I get this money, or I get these grades, or I get this outcome. Sometimes it's looked at as doing it for the sake of doing it, but that's kind of vague, so we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But the idea of just something being extrinsic or intrinsic is really the wrong way to look at it because many things have both components. As a pure intrinsically motivated action, curiosity, self-improvement, self to a purely extrinsic. And people have gone on to say, well, how do we translate that? How do we go from an extrinsic to intrinsic? And maybe we should give them different names. So. Something that's purely extrinsic, I will do this action for the money. No money, no action, okay? Um, but then we get into what is known as introjected motivation. Now this is when the person begins to internalize um, these external reasons. So I feel anxiety if I'm not doing it, I feel guilty, I feel happiness when I've done this behavior, when I get the money or approval by my parents. Now there's some internal motivations. Then more closely related to purely intrinsic is what's known as identified regulation. Person internalizes the importance and usefulness of the behavior. They see the inherent importance of doing the behavior. It's not just about the money, the behavior itself has value. Then, even farther along, we have integrated regulation. Integrated regulation, behavior is consistent with a person's self-concept. This is, this is really at the level of intrinsic motivation. This is what I want to do. This fits with my narrative of my life and how I want to act. Maybe there's some extrinsic rewards, but this is really consistent with what I think is important. And then finally we get into purely intrinsic. Behavior is engaged for its own sake. These are that kind of transition from purely externalized to purely internalized and everywhere in between. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's actually sometimes people, I've, I've found places where they say it's really not a Mark Twain quote. It's good enough, okay? Mark Twain, I never let schooling interfere with my education. You know, this is, was a big philosophy as my, during my undergraduate career. Um, the idea that um, I, I took classes or I, I, I learned about things or I read books on my own because I found them interesting, because I wanted to learn about them. I wasn't so grade driven. That took a while. That certainly wasn't me as a freshman or a sophomore. It became uh, more of the way I educated myself later on. I would take classes, even though they might not be classes I needed to graduate, I needed them because I, I wanted to be educated, you know, maybe art history courses and things like that. And it was really in graduate school that you start to really intrinsically be motivated by the stuff, okay? Because you don't have advisors looking after you that much. You don't have grades that much. You have a few courses, but it's mostly about you educating yourself because you find these things interesting. So, um, intrinsic motivation. Um, you know, Gordon Alport is, is certainly one of the most famous uh, psychologists on, on, on motivation. Um, he talked about functional autonomy of motivation. He says what starts as a means to an end, I must do this to get money, it becomes an end in, in and of itself. The work 
in and of itself is rewarding and it doesn't need that external um, reward. This is that shift from e extrinsic to intrinsic. If you have a job where you are totally motivated extrinsically, it's not such a good job to have. Is intrinsic motivation really the end? You know, I mean, this is the idea that um, there might be some value, some important value that's needed in these types of behaviors that you consider intrinsically motivated, but also serve some very important functions, especially in child development. So, does intrinsic motive? Uh, Veda behavior provide a service? Well, yeah, maybe it's just curiosity. We've talked a little bit about this, about the fact that the brain needs to be stimulated, to be thinking. It's to, for its own health, we, you know? And so maybe these are just, um, we do these behaviors because we need to fulfill these curiosities. Um, sometimes we talk about what Piaget said was mastery play or affectance motivation, the motivation to actively control one's environment. You know, we see this again in child development. Of course, Piaget was very much known for his child development theories. Um, you know, sometimes it might look like there's no explicit external reward, but it might serve that very important internalized reward of how do I understand my environment, how do I control my environment, things like that. Then we get into this notion that's really gained a lot of attention recently. It's been out for a while, but it's this notion of flow. This is the fit between efforts and success. And if you look at this graph here, if you have low skill and low challenge, you know, you get down here in uh, apathy. Apathy's no good. But if you're highly challenged, but you don't have a lot of skill, that's anxiety. But if you're highly challenged and you have a lot of skill, there is that wonderful spot where you are really challenged by what you're doing. And you get into this state. Now, for a long time, people thought this state of flow might be only over a course of a little bit of time. People get into that, that zone, so to speak, where they are highly challenged by what they do, but they are highly skilled, and it's a wonderful state of being, the sprinter, right, or that person focusing on the golf shot. But others actually recently say people can get into that state where they're highly challenged, highly focused, and they get into that really good state of flow that can extend a long period of time. And one of the examples they give is a rock climber. A rock climber is going up the side of the mountain. They may not have safety harnesses, so they must be highly skilled and highly challenged all the time, and they get into a state where they're just not making any mistakes. So artists talk about this, athletes, even scientists. This is a very good state to be in because you are really pushed, pushed to the level where you are meeting the requirements of those actions, but just barely, you know, you're just meeting those requirements, and this is a really good state. Nobody likes things too easy, too hard, and we get anxiety. It's that, that crossroads of just the right amount of being highly challenged, but really meeting that challenge is supposed to be a very good state, that state of flow. So let's talk about extrinsic and intrinsic interactions. You know, what happens to a, a baseball player? You know, he's been playing baseball his whole life. He's played it in Little League. He played it in high school. Loves the game. Loves the game for the sake of the game. Loves to win. All those things. And all of a sudden you start adding money to that component. Does the joy of the game decrease because it's externalized? I'm doing this game to get the money. So what happens when an ap amateur athlete goes pro? Well, let's look at some experiments in a lab. So students were simply asked, hey, come into the lab, work out these puzzles. OK, you're working on these puzzles. At the end of the experiment, students were left in the room for several minutes with the puzzle. OK, your experiment's done. Thank you very much. Hey, could you wait here for just a few minutes? Well, the puzzle's still in front of them. And the question is, do they keep playing with the puzzle? Subjects that were paid, I want you to put this puzzle together and I will pay you X amount, spent less time working on the puzzle during the free time. Others that were not paid kept playing. 
So in other words, when the money stopped, the activity stopped. If the activity of doing the puzzle is because of external, e extrinsic motivations, as opposed to intrinsic, I'm getting the money. That's why I do it. No more money, no more puzzle. When payment was contingent on performance, intrinsic motivation decreased. Somebody else is playing the puzzle. Well, playing the puzzle, I must, I must like it. So we get into this cognitive evaluation theory. A person's intrinsic motivation depends on what is perceived to be the reason they're doing the behavior. If you're doing the behavior to get money, when the money stops, the behavior stops. Okay? So this is a really important thing to understand that money isn't really the best producer of behavior. Like, oh, you do this, do this behavior, do this work, do this job, you get money for it. That really doesn't get us to the peak level of performance. We want people to think about their jobs when they go home. We want people to, to in order to do your job well, if it's all because of the money, the performance is really poor. I, as a college professor, am very lucky. I have a job that promotes a lot of intrinsic motivation. Let's look at another experiment. A pinball experiment. So we have three groups, right? One expected, re, uh, this is called the expected reward group, received money tickets if they played well. The unexpected reward group, that's number two, received money tickets at the end. Three, no reward group. This group didn't get any reward. So what happens is the group knows, group one knows that if they play well, they're going to get money, they're going to get money or they're going to get movie tickets. However, group two, they thought they were just playing it. They were just having fun playing the game. At the end, they get movie tickets. Hey, congratulations, you got some movie tickets. The other group just played the game, and there was never any extrinsic reward at the end. At the end, the experimental left the room, and the, and the participants were told to relax and, or play pinball. You know, it's up to you. Just play, do whatever you want. This is just like the puzzle game. But what's interesting here is these, this group here, number three, there was never any money associated with this. But in group two, there was in the form of movie tickets, but that was unexpected. Here are the results. Extrinsically motivated group played fewer balls, but scored the highest. Ah, okay, so now we're having an interaction. There was some motivating components to the money. They tried their hardest because the money or the movie tickets depended on their game playing. Didn't, the enjoyment of the game didn't differ among the three groups. So the conclusion here is, well, sometimes extrinsic motivation can be helpful. And it can enhance performance if it was interwoven into the playing of the game. The group one that played the game and were, were the game playing resulted in the money or the movie tickets, they played better than all the other groups. So really it's a fine line, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. There's a lot of other really interesting studies about this notion about how best to motivate um, you know, your workers, about when you give them money, how you give them money, how they get the best performance, because sometimes rewarding them with money for doing a good job is actually a good thing. This experiment shows that. But if you want to have them continue to do the work, maybe think about the work at home, maybe take pride in the work, then there has to be some strong intrinsic motivations. Okay, so let's get into some other rather simple um, theories about the effort of the work. This is known as the least effort. This was a principle put forth by Edward Tolman. The amount of effort made or energy expended affected behavior. And he did a lot of work with rats. If two options provide the same amount of reward, the animal will take the least path, right? So this is, this is a, a very simple experiment both get the same reward, the animal will expend the least amount of energy. It'll go for the short distance. This is very similar to Hull's theory of law of less work. So if two behaviors provide equal reward and take an equal amount of time, the animal will choose the one that is the least laborious 
uh, of the behaviors. So here's an experiment that kind of supports that. A very simple experiment. Uh, Maurer and Jones, rats, all learned to press a lever to get food. All were given extinction. In other words, they press the lever and they get nothing. And the lever, the groups, there were different groups. One group, it only took 1.5 grams of force. And the third group took 80 grams. That's really hard to push. So which one of these groups um, took longer to extinguish? This one right here didn't take hardly any effort, so the animal was able to continue it longer. So the extinguished responses, this is that really low effort, the animal kept pressing, but 80, the animal stopped. Goes a little bit into the notion of the energy expenditure idea, the animal's expending energy. And that comes to this theory here, something that I worked with a lot when I work with animal behavior. It's called the optimal foraging theory. The idea is that through natural selection, animals that want to survive the best, produce the most offspring, those kinds of things, one would think that the brain, in a sense, would be evolutionarily designed, careful with the word designed here, so that foraging animals make a choice that ultimately gives them the most amount of energy for energy expended. Net energy. Animals should make choices so as to maximize their net energy. What do I mean by net energy? Okay. Let's say we have two carrots. We have one carrot here, three carrots here, two places for carrots. And out comes a bunny, he goes running over, and he eats the carrots. Three carrots compared to this one, this group, that ran over here to get one carrot. Now, this one has more energy, three carrots. But it also took a lot more energy to get there. This one has less energy but it took less energy to get there. So you might get 90 calories from the carrots, but it took you 80 calories to get there. You have a net, uh, net energy that you get from making that choice, 10 calories. This one only had 30 calories, but it could get there really quickly. And that net energy is 20 calories. So optimal foraging theory says an animal, after learning about this, should go and get the one carrot versus the three carrot because ultimately gets the most amount of energy. Well, I've worked a lot with optimal foraging theory when I've worked with animals. It doesn't always account for a foraging decision. It doesn't always work. It's kind of a good rule of thumb, but it doesn't always work. It assumes that the animal has complete knowledge, complete understanding of everything available, how much energy it'll get, how much energy it will expend, that's probably not always the case. A scene uh, assumes a complete performance. Once the animal learns that option A has more energy than option B should always go to A, but they don't ever do that. If option A has more energy than option B, we get into matching a little bit. We get into relative choices. So it kind of fails there. And then we get into what's known as sort of a tautological argument. It's kind of circular. You would say, um, they choose an option that provides the greatest energy. Which of the which has the greatest net energy? The one that ha that they chose. That's a circular argument. And they say, well, if you chose that one, chose A over B, um, A provides them the best long-term energy. But we calculated it, and it really doesn't. Well, you maybe you're not taking into account this factor or that factor or or long-term gain or all these other factors because he must be, it must have the most energy because that's the one he's choosing. How do you know he's, uh, what dictates his choice? The one with the most energy. That's a circular argument or tautological. Still, it's, a, it's not a bad theory, it's just, it just falls a little short sometimes. Now, uh, Ziff's principle of least effort really applies to cognition, the idea that we make the least amount of effort in our cognitive thoughts. Applied to language. Words with more meanings are used more often. There is an inverse relationship between the length of the word and the frequency of its use. So we see the evolution of language. So nobody, when, when cars came out for the very first time, people called them automobiles, automobiles. And then finally people were able to shorten them. You know, we see this a lot in texting. Um, the shortening of words. 
Okay, that's good to know, don't you think? BTW, by the way. I don't know if it's such a good idea, but I thought this was kind of a funny little cartoon. I was just born. Um, okay, so these ideas of Leaf's effort are not only dealing with energy, but cognitive decisions. We call this cognitive economizing, the law of least effort applied to cognitive computation. This gets us into trouble sometimes, and I'm going to talk about when. Do we always spend the effort to reason out the most efficient method providing the greatest outcome when deciding a behavior? We already talked a little bit about this when we talked about the somatic marker hypothesis. You know, the idea that it doesn't work really that well to have so many choices. Sometimes just making a short, quick choice, even in the long run if it's not the best thing, might be the way we, we work. Perhaps we just try to follow some rules instead of really trying to figure out how to maximize um, what we get. Then we get into this word, satisficing. That's a fun word. People want to solve problems, plan behavior, and make decisions with the least effort. So, what's a good choice? Better good choice today than a great choice tomorrow, you know, with the least amount of effort. What's not necessarily the best choice, but a good choice? So we tend, to, this is a tendency to select the first option that meets a given uh, need or addresses what um, the option. It's a tendency to select the first option that meets a given need or select the option that seems to address most of the needs. Okay, Maybe we just look at it emotionally or enjoyment instead of calculating everything out. But like I said, we get into some trouble because we create what are known as heuristics. These are kind of rules of thumbs. These are the idea that I'm going to just follow this pattern and that will seem to solve my problems best of all. Rule of thumb. These are shortcuts, cognitive shortcuts. Not, be, not necessarily the best results, but good results. It might save time, might save effort, might even make us more satisfied in the end. But we get biases that come with the heuristics because of these problems, because of these shortcuts. So let me talk about a few of the most common kinds. The one that's kind of an umbrella for a lot of different types of heuristics and biases is called the representative heuristic. It's a judgment about whether an object or event is a member of a particular category. To what degree does A resemble B? Instance, sample, person, category, population, group. Um, this gets into trouble with racism sometimes. We kind of group people together by what they, how they look, how they talk, those kinds of things. So to what degree is there that, is, does this represent that? So let me give you an example uh, of a representative bias. Uh, this is known as the conjunction fallacy. We'll come to that in a second. Here's a very common example. Let's say you get a description of a woman. Linda. She's 31 years old, single, outspoken, and bright. She majored in philosophy and was concerned about social justice as a student. She participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Okay, so you get an image of this person. Now my question is, if you were given a choice between this, Linda is a bank teller, or B, she's a bank teller who is active in feminist movement, in a feminist movement. Um, most people choose B because it seems to fit. But you really should choose A because B is in there, right? A bank teller is in there. But a bank teller adds details that she might not have. Okay? So by adding detail, you reduce the probability. She might not be a feminist or involved in a feminist movement. Okay? Both of them say she's a bank teller. But we people choose B because they have this, this, this representative bias. So this is a conjunction fallacy, what I just gave you was an example 
a type of systematic bias associated with a representative heuristic. People often judge the probability of a joint stochastic event, uh, an event with some variability, as higher than the probability of each alone. So the probability of being both A and B can't equal the prob probability of B, A or B alone. That has to have less probability than those two. More detail, less probable, but more plausible. And that's the key. So what's wrong with B, a bank tailor and a feminist? This can't be. It can't be more likely than just being a bank teller because we've added detail. What if I said a bank teller or a bank teller with red hair? Well, then you'd say, well, just a bank teller because that is a larger picture. But that's just what we've done. Even though I gave you some descriptions that made you in your mind say, oh, she, okay, she fits this category. So we're coming back to Kahneman and Trevetsky. And this is, they say, as amount of detail in a scenario increases, its probability decreases, but its representativeness, in other words, how it fits in your head, and hence its apparent likelihood may increase. So sometimes people, especially like politician stuff, will start adding detail to make it more believable. Even though as they add more detail, it becomes the, the circle becomes smaller and smaller and it becomes less likely. So this is just a bias that we have a tendency to do. Added detail does not increase likely like uh, likelihood, but it in our brain, it seems more plausible. That's a irrational kind of thinking. Let's look at one more. This is called the base rate fallacy, a systematic bias brought on by the representative heuristic. The base rate fallacy is the, fa is the failure to take base rates into account when judging probability. In such a task, you are given statistics for a population as well as a particular case. I'm going to give you an example of that in just a second. Both of them should be considered when people look at likelihood of events, but people tend to ignore the population and look at the detail. When presented with a statistic about the population as a whole, people tend to ignore them and think about themselves as a completely different entity. Okay, So let's look at this. Here's an example. John is a man who wears gothic-inspired clothing, has long black hair, and listens to death metal. How likely is it that he is a Christian? How likely is it that he is a Satanist, that, he's, that he worships Satan? Well, we got in our mind a little bit about John. We put him in our head, and we said, well, he's much more likely to be a Satanist than a Christian. Well, the base rate is that there is probably 999 Christians in this country for every person who worships Satan. So just in terms of the population as a whole, John is much more likely to be a Christian. But you put him into that category. You took out that population probability and just looked at him as an individual. I mean, let's, let's look at John. How many Christians do you think wear gothic-inspired clothing and listen to death metal? Probably a lot. I'm not saying everyone, but probably a lot. And there's a lot of them. So we, the likelihood, the likelihood is that he's a Christian. But we think of him in isolation and make mistakes about that in terms of the base rate, the basic population rate compared to the individual. So how do you avoid these representative biases? Um, don't be misled by details in a scenario. Even though it becomes more plausible, it becomes less likely. Pay attention to base rates. And of course, remember, chance is not self-correcting. That's one of my favorite things. So if you go into a casino, sometimes casinos have this thing next to a roulette wheel. So here's the roulette wheel. It goes round and round. And you have blacks and you have... Um, you have red squares and you have a couple of green squares as well. And if a whole bunch of blacks come up, 
somebody might say, well, I'm going to bet on red. Because if five blacks have come up, you know, what's the chance that the next would to six? Boy, six blacks in a row, that's so hard. That's such a rare thing. I'm going to bet all on red. But every time you spin the, the, the wheel, the statistics are the same. And so they put up these things to provoke people into looking for patterns. There's no patterns. Well, three reds in a row, well, I'm going to bet on black or two reds or whatever. So these are oftentimes used to make people mistake, mistakenly gamble on the wrong, on, on, on things thinking they have a greater chance. Um, I oftentimes hear this with slot machines. People say, well, this person was playing a slot machine for a long time and they didn't win anything. And when they left, I go, wow, it hasn't given a, a winning hand. It hasn't given a winning a spin in so long. It must be due. Every time the slot machine goes, it's the same individual statistics as every other time. Ah, it's just our biases. We, th we try to look for those patterns. So finally, the last one is called the availability heuristic. This is a cognitive shortcut where people make judgments about an event, about how readily it comes to mind, can produce over and underestimations of biases. So we see this in the press a lot. The press saying over and over maybe the threat of nuclear or biological attack or the threat of a terrorist. And you hear that and you think about those probabilities. So. Which causes more deaths in Afghanistan, terrorist attack or car accidents? Well, we hear Afghanistan or we hear the Middle East or something like that. We hear about terrorists. We put them together. We hear them together so much that we overestimate its occurrence. Of course, it's car accidents by a big factor. What about which kills more people, horses or sharks? Well, we, every time somebody gets killed by a shark, we hear about it in the news. Somebody gets killed by a horse, we don't hear about it that often. So we overrepresent the shark attack. So this can really get us in a lot of trouble. You know, Americans spend 25 times more money fighting terrorists than fighting cancer. But cancer kills 2,000 times as many people as terrorists do. But if we hear things in the news over and over, they become more and more believable the more we hear them. And this is why we get politicians and pundits on the TV having these talking points where they say things, repeat things over and over and over again and they just become more and more believable. Even if they're not, say it over and over again and it becomes more believable. It really gets us in a lot of trouble. Okay, that's the end.